OK, I think I can now connect with Andrew Rhodes, who's the Chief Executive of the Gambling Commission. Andrew, good morning. How are you? Um, can you hear me OK, Andrew? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Can hear you well. Thanks for thanks for joining us this morning. I was really interested in your interview in the in the Racing Post today, and I I was particularly struck by by the section in which you you tried to to outline and clarify exactly what your instructions had been to bookmakers as regards affordability checks in this last period. Just but perhaps you can underline that that for us. What's been the Gambling Commission's role in outlining what they should be doing? No, it's a, it's a really good question. There's an awful lot of, um, I think, a bit of misinformation, misunderstanding around at the moment. And it's it's obviously a quite an emotional topic for a lot of people and I completely understand that. You know, our, the problem we have to solve here are the sorts of cases we've been seeing in the last few years that really haven't been improving. And this is people losing amounts of money well, well beyond their means. And when I say that, I'm not talking about some moral judgment as to what you can spend your money on. I'm talking about people losing, say, £245,000 when they earn £30,000, somebody losing £70,000 in, in 10 hours on the day they, they open their account. And these are the problems that we've said the industry has really got to solve, and everybody agrees on that. So whether that's in the trade press around gambling, whether that's operators, consumers, politicians, everybody agrees on that. And that's what we've said the industry really has to focus on. I think that's, I think that's really important to remember. And the sorts of people that we're talking about, the sorts of proportions we're talking about here, people who are at risk around gambling. And let's, let's remember, 22 and a half million people a year will gamble on a regular basis in this country. It's the largest online uh, gambling industry in the world. Um, most people won't be affected, but there is a proportion of people who, who will be, and that, that's in hundreds of thousands, and they can have terrible consequences, devastating impacts for them and their families. So we have to, we have to guard against that, and that's, that's part of our obligations. And that's really where we want industry to be focused, is in, in making sure that they are uh, reducing the level of risk for, for consumers in that area. What, what exactly have you told the bookmakers to do as regards affordability checks? What exactly have you mandated? So we haven't mandated affordability checks. What we've said to the industry is you have to make sure that you have policies and procedures in place that guard against risk for consumers. So, and all operators, that's just a, a requirement that they have to have. They have to meet that requirement. We've not specified it must be at this, this pounds level. We've not specified what proportion of people's income they're allowed to gamble. What we've tried to do is offer advice on different things the industry might consider. But you have to remember each operator, <clears throat> excuse me, is also different. So we've got operators who will be at the, if I call it the upper end of the market in terms of the net worth of the customers they've got. So they'll have people gambling very large amounts of money and that's fine. So long as they've got the procedures in place to manage that, then there's no issue with that whatsoever. And you've also got operators within the industry who will be high frequency, low spend, which are obviously completely different. So it's up to the individual operator to pitch things where they see the risk as being. And that's what we've said is perfectly appropriate. It's the way the model is constructed, so is how the legislation works. And that's what we've told them to focus on. We haven't said you, you must uh, check pay slips. We haven't said you must ask for bank statements. But operators have to undertake checks or to rather tests when they feel a consumer has reached a certain level of spend. Uh, to satisfy themselves that they that they can go beyond that. It's not the only thing we expect operators to look at. We expect them to look at how much someone is playing, whether their patterns of behaviour have changed, whether there are other risk factors. But let's remember, the proportion of people that we're really talking about here will be less than 10% yes. of people who are engaged in gambling on a regular basis. This isn't about what, what gets described as average punters. Uh, well, well I, I, I was... Joined earlier on in, in the show, Andrew. I don't know if you if you saw by by Steve Preston. Um, oh, I joined I, just I, after I, that, I'm afraid. And I I, I, cer I certainly um, didn't didn't prep him in any way. We were talking about his own punting habits. He said he was a twenty to fifty pound punter. Maybe bet two, three, four times a week. He called himself regular in every respect. Regular in the amounts he was punting. Regular in terms of how often he was doing it. He was a loser, but not by by a huge amount. He is a a very successful businessman. He has means. He he has been asked 
for affordability checks. So if he's being asked for affordability checks, it suggests that surely more than 20% of punters are being asked for are being asked for something that you would describe as as friction on the way in to to, to placing a bet. So it's, it's really difficult for me to comment on an individual case without without knowing all the details. So what you described there is not the sort of thing that I would expect to be caught up here. What he's describing right, there so, would be so you're, would be you're, no different you're, you're to saying, what Andrew, I that's do. wrong. Are the, are the bookmakers wrong then to be asking him for an affordability check for, for his bank statements and his and his payslips? Well, I don't know the reason why they did. I, I I don't know what they were looking at. I don't know where they've decided to to pitch their risk. There are bookmakers who have decided to change the the mix of customers they've got. There are lots of different moving things in the gambling industry at the moment. So it wouldn't be fair for me to comment on an individual case without being able to see all the details. What you describe is not the sort of problem that we are trying to solve or the industry says it's trying to solve. But without knowing all the details, it's a bit like when I get people talk to me about withdrawals without without knowing all the details it's difficult for me to comment on individual cases what we are what we are focused on are levels of gambling which are likely to be harmful to an individual they may not be but we can see the elevated risk and that's where we've asked the industry to pay much closer attention because we've seen in recent years these cases that everybody feels are wrong have continued continue to occur so how are the industry getting this so wrong then well, it depends on it depends on your perception, doesn't it? So there's a lot there's a lot of discussion around this, and we have to remember the problem we're trying to solve, which, which I've talked about already. There are lots of different moving parts within the gambling industry at the moment. So you've got operators who've decided that they don't want to have higher spending customers. You've got operators who've changed the mix of what they do, the different products they want to offer, but. What we, we do need the white paper to be published, obviously, because we need that government policy position to be set out. And hopefully we will, we will get that soon. We've been operating for a long time without having that. And we understand the reasons why. We understand why that's been difficult. So we'll need to move forward with that. I'm not saying operators are, are getting things wrong necessarily. At some point when <clears throat> you are gambling, and you reach a, a risk threshold for that operator, they're going to have to do something about that. They're going to have to ask some questions. In terms of financial information, I would be quite surprised if that was the first interaction, unless you're depositing a very large amount of money and then we're talking about money laundering checks. Then I would expect that you've had you know, an interaction before financial information has been requested. But ultimately, an operator has to be able to satisfy itself. It has to ask some questions. There are a lot of different ways it can go about answering those questions. So I'm not going to say that operators are necessarily getting it wrong. But clearly, there are changes in the industry. See, see what I don't understand, Andrew, is that, is that <clears> for <throat> two and a half years now, since this topic has been on the table and we've been discussing it every week, we have been laboring perhaps under the under the view now you're saying it's a misapprehension the affordability checks are round the corner anytime soon in the white paper the bookmakers are laying the groundwork for that at your behest and now you're telling us that that's wrong but you've said nothing to this point so why have you said nothing till now well i think you in a sense you answer the question a little bit then nick you know it's a difficult one for the regulator when you're waiting for a white paper to be published you're trying not to preempt what the government is going to do. We've obviously been talking to the government throughout the development of the white paper. The government has made clear that it, it thinks something needs to happen in this space. The Betting and Gaming Council's chair has previously said, I think it was to the House of Lords, that something needs to happen in this space. There are lots of people who said that we can't carry on with the sorts of cases that we've seen. So during the last you know, two and a half years that you mentioned, you know, we've been focused on trying to deal with those issues. This is a tricky one for us to talk about because as soon as, and I'm sure it'll happen today, mm. as soon as I've said something to the Racing Poster, I say something to you today, and I'm really glad you've invited me on today to be able to talk about this. Somebody will say, we're prejudging the white paper or, or something else. The reality is there are, there are risks that are present in the industry now that need to be addressed. And that's what we've been focused on. As I said, it's in that range of customers that are experiencing harm or are likely to. And it's the sorts of extreme cases that we've been drawing attention to during the last two years. That's right. where and we're really focused. Andrew, let's get, let's, get, let's get down to the numbers then. How many by percentage problem gamblers are there in, in the UK? 
So these figures get used in different ways by people, and I saw some of that uh, in the media over the weekend. No, no, but you, you're, you're, so, you're the chief executive yeah, yeah. of the Gambling Commission, so never mind what other people say, what do you say? Because you're, you're the guy that's supposed to, to, supposed to know for sure. So the problem gambling rate for the UK population, which is the whole population, includes people who gamble and don't gamble, is between 0.3 and 0.5%, and that's several hundred thousand people. Beyond that, you've got people at risk, so that percentage starts to build out. It's different, though, between different activities. Yeah. So it's important when people talk about the problem gambling rate, they don't apply that to every activity, yeah, because I'm, online the problem gambling absolutely. rate is obviously quite a lot higher. And I'm going to I'm going to come to that point. You raise a very interesting point. And I'm going to come to that very soon because I want to talk about uh, the different ways you can gamble and the graduation of risk. But first of all, I want to talk about um, what you believe your role is as chief executive of the gambling commission. What you believe the gambling commission's role is? Uh, would you agree with me that your role is to represent the interests of all gambling consumers? Yes, I've said exactly that um, in a number of on a number of occasions. Yeah, <clears throat> I said exactly that when I spoke to the whole industry, or actually the majority of the industry back in November. So what said, what, perce what percentage of gamblers, Andrew, are not at risk or um, at risk of gambling related harm? Well, that varies depending on what their form of gambling is. So the majority of people are now gambling online, and we know that the the, the risk uh, online because you can play 24 hours a day, different markets, uh, you can play in, on different events around the world. We know that that is higher. Yeah. So in terms of the problem gambling rate, it's, it's important to understand that that does break down to different levels. But, but you can't, you've got to be able to put a figure on it for me. How many, how many gamblers <clears throat> are not considered at risk? So again, it depends on what they're gambling on. So the, the thing here, Nick, and this comes to... But give, but give me a global how, figure and then I can move on to the next question. How many, how, many, how many gamblers from your latest data are not considered at risk? What percentage? Well, that will clearly be high. As I've said, 22.5 mm. million people gamble on a regular yep. basis. Most will not experience any harm at all. That's why we're focused on the proportion we will be. So if you're gambling online, the, the online gambling harm rate is a little under 10%. Mm -hmm. So that's considerably higher than the, the rate for the okay, whole I, population. I, 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 think, I think we're both driving towards the same point here. So over 90% of people are considered to be safe gamblers who are not at risk of doing themselves or their family any harm. And it's, it's way up into the, into the high 90s as well. You and, I, you and I both know that. Now, you talk about graduated risk. Um, there are reasons, for example, why there are variable speed limits around different roads mm -hmm. in the country. You are at more risk of causing an accident on one than you are in the other. Why is all sports betting, and particularly betting on horse racing, being dealt with in the same way as what you yourself describe in your latest study as a much higher risk form of gambling, i.e. online casinos and slots? And why isn't there a differentiation? And why have you not stipulated that there should be a differentiation to all the bookmakers? Well, that assumes that people who gamble on horse racing only gamble on horse racing. And that's not the case. So for so I would agree with you, that, and I've said this publicly many, many times, the vast majority of people who engage in gambling on a regular basis will not be at risk. They will not experience harm. Some, however, will, and some will be of higher risk. But if you talk about horse racing and pretend it's on its own, then I'm afraid that's misleading. So what we see for those who are at risk, and this is who we're talking about here. So I would agree with people, broadly speaking, who say, well, uh, you know, you should focus on those people who, who might be at risk and leave everybody else alone. I would largely agree with that. It's a bit more complicated, but I would largely agree with that. Where but you, people but you, are, you, accept, you accept that betting on horse racing in and of itself is a fundamentally less risky pursuit, if you want to use that adjective, than betting casino slots. Well, we have, to, we have to see these things together, Nick. So the point that I'm trying to make here is people who are at risk with gambling are not only necessarily betting on racing. They will have a number of different things they're doing. We're predominantly here talking about online. So when, some, when a bookmaker is looking at a customer 
they will look at their activity, yes, on horse racing, but they may also be doing online casino. They may also be betting on football. They may also be doing a number of other things. So they look at their aggregated activity. That's what we're talking about. So the, the whole debate about trying to separate horse racing out, I understand why people do that and why people talk about it, but people who are at risk around gambling harm are not doing solely one thing and operators need to look at the totality of that customer's activity that's the important thing you cannot separate racing out but well, there's another can. factor you can set you can separate racing and sports betting out by having by having separate wallets and monitoring people's behavior in different ways that they they bet you you yourself in your latest study in 2021 you're very clear what you said about the most risky behaviors yes i mean there are products that are more risky than other things but yeah. then we, we can't we can't pretend, Nick, that people who are gambling are, are that separated out because they're not. We know people at risk will gamble on what we call multiple verticals. So they will have a whole range of products they're gambling on. And what you're suggesting there would be for the industry to, in effect, disaggregate itself and separate it out into these different different products. And that's that's not necessarily the right thing to do for consumers who are not at risk. But there is something in relation to horse racing's risks specifically. So, you know, our job is to regulate gambling. It's not for me to try and give expert opinion on any given sport you know there are others who will do that but we do know from the data that for 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 racing for horse racing online 70 percent of the losses to bookmakers come from just one percent of accounts and that's a much higher reliance than we see in sports betting it's a much higher reliance than we see across other forms of gambling so horse racing is different in that we definitely see a different level of losses from a smaller number of people and that's something that is also you know, a risk factor for racing, and it's something that we see in looking at the activity around gambling on racing. We agreed on a figure in the end, somewhere deep into the 90s, of the percentage of gamblers, and as you quite rightly point out, over 22 million people in this country that you are, you are representing as a gambling commission. But how are you, how are you re representing that 97, 98, 99%? All they're seeing over the last two years is friction on the way in and, just as importantly, friction on the way out of their dealings with, with bookmakers. Well, and Nick, Nick we, didn't, we didn't agree on that number. So you asked me about, uh, about well, where, we, the harm, where the harm level is. And I've said if people are gambling online, then the number's quite a bit higher that, that, than you just quoted. But I'm happy to say that the vast majority of people who engage in gambling are unlikely to be harmed. They're likely to be in that recreational space. It will not be a huge part of what they do, be something that they will enjoy. And yes, we're here for all consumers. We have an obligation to permit gambling, providing it meets the licensing objectives. It has to be fair and open, it has to be crime free, and it has to be, uh, we have to not harm people. And that's where we're focused on. So our efforts are around making sure that gambling is fair and open and making sure that operators reduce uh, the level of, of harm and that's what we're here for as a regulator. How much time do you spend talking to gamblers Andrew? So we've got a whole range of different ways that we do this so we've got in-depth research from uh, our research and statistics team so we publish that on a regular basis. I meet with people with lived experience from gambling, I gamble myself, I talk to a lot of other people that do, I speak to the industry on a regular basis, I met with the chief executives of the largest operators just two weeks ago and I go out and see people on a regular basis and, and talk to them about what, what they're doing. This gambling review is a it's been described as a once in a generation opportunity to make gambling fair and safe for all to bring you know, the analog into a into a digital age what's been your most significant contribution to this review do you think as a gambling commission i think the most significant contribution is bringing the wider research to the white paper and that wider understanding of how people actually gamble. That's why I'm emphasizing the point today. I don't think you can see any particular sport or any particular activity in isolation. Actually, the, the uh, participation and prevalence data on our Paths to Play data show 
what the motivations and behaviors of different gamblers is and how they actually behave in reality. There's an awful lot of strong opinion and I'm sure there'll be plenty on your program today. And I think that's, that's fine. This is an area that people do have strong opinions on in all kinds of directions. What we try and do is cut through some of that with the evidence, the statistics, the research, the detailed mm -hmm. analysis of what goes on to try and help, help inform the best decision making yeah. that we can. But I bring you back to your I bring you back to your own national strategic assessment where you say the speed and frequency of the gambling opportunity within a game impacts the risk. Activities that permit high frequency participation are more likely to be associated with harm and more readily facilitate problematic behavior such as as loss chasing. Activities mm -hmm. with high event frequency are likely to be the most attractive. As a result, online slots, casino and bingo are at higher risk. We are focusing on products that behave like this and the measures that can be put in place to make these products safer. And now you're telling me you cannot look at each individual method of gambling or each individual area of gambling discreetly. Yet you advocated a degree of discretion in that strategic assessment in 2020. That's not what I said though, Nick. So I would agree with that assessment because it's it's based on the evidence. Those, those products are higher risk. But what I also said to you is when you're talking about somebody who is gambling at a higher risk level, they are often gambling in multiple different ways, not just those things. They'll be engaging in other things as well. So let's take a, let's make up an example. It's always, always difficult, but make up an example of somebody who is using online slots, doing online casino, but is also betting on the racing. So you might, and they might be betting on football as well. Chances are they're probably doing all of those sorts of things. If an operator is then intervening with them because they've reached a certain level of activity or spend, and that could just be an interaction checking they're okay, that'll be because of the totality of what they're doing. So I don't think you and I are in different places, Nick, when we talk about what the risks are. I'm not saying the risks of those products aren't the highest. They are. We say it on a very regular basis. But you have to see the total customer behavior as a whole. But this, but this that's, sport, that's this what that's what the industry has to do. But the effect on this industry, the racing industry, has been huge. One senior executive estimated a forty million pound loss to the industry based on a loss of eight hundred million pound turnover. Every, everybody knows that people are migrating to the black market, and you will say, "Well, you don't have the data for that." Well, of course not, because it's the black market. But we do have evidence of significant losses to the industry. This is an industry that employs tens of thousands of people, is responsible for a massive workforce, is contributing hundreds of millions to the exchequer on an annual basis. And the fact that um, regulator wants to lump in betting on horse racing with high risk high energy, high frequency activities means that racing's being 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 lumped in with with something that needs to be regulated much more much more severely. Okay, Nick, let's take let's take those two things. So I'm not saying that racing is the same as the other things. You, you keep making the point, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that with somebody who might be at risk of gambling, you have to see the totality of what they do. Some of that might be racing. Some of it might be a mixture of other things. Bookmakers are looking at the, the overall level of activity. So you cannot separate racing out if somebody's gambling on a multitude of things. But let's take the argument about the losses to the racing industry. So as I said earlier on, our job is to regulate gambling. It's not to try and give expert commentary on any particular sport or subset within the industry beyond what we see in terms of the gambling statistics. But let's look at, let's look at racing. What is the effect of bookmakers deciding they want to have lower risk customers, which a number have done. What's the effect of competition with other gambling products? What's the effect of best odds guarantees going because of media disputes? What's the effect of all the complaints we see about field sizes? What's the effect that racing is a much, much older demographic than other forms of sports betting? What's the effect of racing being dependent on 70% of losses to bookmakers, which, which want to fund the industry, coming from just 1% of accounts? don't need much movement in all of those things to have an effect. So I don't think you can sensibly say that for everything that's going on in, in racing and everything that's gone on since the pandemic and all the different issues that swirl around, that you can accurately say this is all down to bookmakers asking questions about affordability. Also, when we talk about the people who are, are at risk, and I, 
don't disagree with your point about online slots, etc. But if you look at the totality of a customer's activity, but, but Andrew, Andrew, we're talking about every, less everything than you've 10% just said is pu- everything you've just said is purely anecdotal. So you're you're trying to pick but, apart my my non-evidence based assertion that it's to do with uh, the threat of affordability checks, and everything you've just thrown at me is completely anecdotal. The idea that it's because of an aging population. That's a lot of people dying to knock off 40 million from, from, from racing's coffers in, in no time at all. What, what I'm saying to you, Nick, is you've got people arguing the only issue here can be bookmakers asking questions about someone's financial position when they reach a certain trigger. So these are not, these should not be average punters. And we've certainly never said that we would want bookmakers asking questions of people. You know, it's it, the idea that we've sat down and gone, if you want to put £50 on, on the races, that you should have an affordability check. That's just nonsense. What I'm saying to you is, just as some people are arguing, well, it can only come down to this issue, there are a whole range of other issues. And I think there are questions about what are the interrelated effects of that? But I come back to the point that I understand why you want to make the point, and I, I do understand your point, that there are higher risk products than horse racing. Yes, there are. There are higher risk products than, than you know, compared to a lot of different activities that people are engaged in with gambling. But people who are at risk from gambling do not solely gamble on one thing or another. And that's why bookmakers will look at the totality of what they do. And that might have an effect on racing if people are therefore gambling less as a result in those in those cohorts. There's no doubt that the income into racing has fallen. But also blackjack is at two thirds of the level it was in, in 2019. The overall activity in the gambling industry in the last year has seen actually, I think it's four billion more bets placed amongst the largest operators, four million active more active accounts. But we've seen losses to, to play it from players going down. So we're definitely seeing some adjustments, but I don't think you can, you, I don't think the evidence exists to pin something on one specific factor. There are always more things going on within gambling than that. Andrew, we'll have to leave it there. Andrew Rose, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Nick. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.